to the Exploress, time traveling through history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. The Exploress is currently between seasons. As you listen to this, I'm probably off somewhere reading and taking fervent notes about women in a whole new time and place. Lucky for you, though, I recently had the opportunity to read an advanced copy of a historical novel set in the ancient world. It's called The Wolf Den by Elodie Harper, and I just knew I had to tell you all about it. Let's set the scene. Imagine yourself down the loud, bustling streets of ancient Pompeii. Turn the corner and walk into that shadowy doorway. You've just entered the Lupinar. That word tells us that we're in the town brothel, but it also means den of wolves. Here we find she-wolves, women from all over, all of them enslaved and forced to ply one of the world's oldest trades. Our heroine is Amara. When her father died, she was sold into slavery by her destitute mother, and now she must do whatever it takes to survive. But Amara's spirit is far from broken. By day, she walks the streets with the wolf den's other women, finding comfort in the laughter and the dreams they share. And the streets of Pompeii are alive with opportunity. Even the lowest slave can secure a reversal of fortune. Sharp, clever, and resourceful, Amara will do anything to find her way to freedom. But in the cutthroat world she has to live in, how much is that freedom going to cost? The Wolf Den is everything I love in historical fiction. Rich and immersive, it really does make you feel like you've traveled back in time. And the author, Elodie Harper, lets us see it through the eyes of some of Pompeii's most interesting and overlooked women, giving them a vibrant and captivating voice. I recently sat down with Elodie to talk about her inspirations, her characters, and what it meant to be a woman in the ancient world. So settle in and enjoy our conversation. Elodie, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about your book, The Wolf Den. I'm so excited to have you. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. It's great. Thank you. Of course. Well, I had the extreme privilege of being able to read your book a little bit early, which was super fun. And I I just loved it. It's an incredibly immersive story. You know, my podcast is all about time traveling back through history to try to find out what it was like to live in the past. And reading your book definitely felt like time travel. So it's my favorite kind of book. Oh, thank you so much. That honestly means a lot because that's what I love doing too. And it's really what I hoped to give readers was just the feeling of time travel I had writing it, honestly. So that's great to hear. Thank you so much. So what inspired you to write your book and how or where was the seed of the idea first planted for you? It's been such a long process and in some ways a a lifelong process. So even as a kid, I was really interested in the Greek myths and in ancient Rome. And then I studied it at school. I did Latin and Greek. I was a bit rubbish at Greek, to be honest, but I loved Latin. Um, And I studied that all the way up to university level. I mean, I had an English literature degree, but I did a paper in in Latin literature Um, And so I read some of the texts in the original, mainly, you know, it has to be said in translation. Um, So it it was a world that I've always been fascinated by and I always wanted to write about it. But I think it is quite a male dominated subject, both, you know, the characters um, that you learn about are are mainly male. The people who write about it today are mainly male, although we've obviously got Mary Beard, you know, blazing a huge trail for um, women scholars in the area. And in fact, more and more now, there are a lot of, of, of women scholars. But generally, that, that was the feeling. So it took me a long while to have the confidence to write about that era. And then when I did, I mean, Pompeii is quite an obvious choice because you can wander around the site. You can really have a sense of what that town was like, um, which as a writer is just such a gift. And the Lupana seems, I know, a kind of left field way to to come into writing a book about, you know, a female centred book, given it's such a a misogynist concept of of a place, really. And even today, you know, just the way that it's in the tour in quite a sort of titillating way, the women are still somewhat objectified, objectified in the way it's looked at. And I just wanted to do it differently, honestly. It was it was quite a challenge. I wanted to write a book that was neither 
really grim and depressing and kind of, oh, isn't this awful? And also wasn't, which I absolutely loathe, the kind of titillating, oh, look at all these happy hookers, to use the horrible phrase, you know, that you get that kind of really naff view of what it might have been like, that everyone's really sort of jolly and bouncy. I didn't want either of those. I wanted to think about people as people, really, and just explore the idea that this... (laughs) You know, this is a part of women's experiences throughout history, this lack of sexual agency. It really is not unique to women in brothels. You know, women didn't have any agency over who they married or, or very rarely they did sometimes. But, you know, there was a lot less agency. So I didn't feel I wanted to feel like there was not such a huge gap between the women in the Lupana and other women. So that was also partly why I wrote it. And it's also just an amazingly fascinating building, honestly. I mean, it's such an evocative place. You know, it, it really is. Well, let's talk about the place a little bit. I mean, the setting in the book is really its own character. It's so visceral. It's so detailed. I mean, as I said before, reading the book really felt like I was there in ancient Pompeii and seeing the sights and smelling the smells and really there with these women. So obviously you had to do a lot of research to be able to get all of that onto the page. So what did your research process look like? Well, about 10 years ago, I went to this exhibition at the British Museum, um, Life and Death in Pompeii and Herculaneum, and it just blew my mind, honestly. It it was just such a brilliantly done exhibition, and having subsequently been to the site, it's the nearest you can get that I've found of not actually being in Pompeii, and they themed it, and, you know, there was gardens, there was taverns, there was... Um, They reconstructed some of these areas. There was a lot about sex because one of the really remarkable things about Pompeii is just how much there is about sex, not just the brothel. Um, So I was just fascinated by it as a place. Then in terms of the sort of specific process for this book, uh, I knew I was going to go to the site. But before I did, I read quite a lot prior to that. You know, uh, Mary Beard's Pompeii is is just incredibly detailed and evocative and, you know, it gives you a lot of information and also a lot of um, picture books. Uh, picture books make it sound like a kid, but I mean, sorry, a lot of books with a lot of high quality illustrations. Um, and then source books, um, Alison Cooley's Pompeii and Herculaneum, which has a lot of the graffiti to, because graffiti was a really key component of, of building that particular world and also I have to be honest a lot of the book is based on um, Latin texts so it's um, you know it's something of a conversation one-sided conversation on my part with um, you know texts like Ovid's Art of Love is was it was a huge part of the book which is almost like a pickup artist's Oh, yeah. Manual. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's a straight up pickup artist book, of course. It is, <laughs> isn't it? And it's so, it's both deeply regressive, but also very modern because these attitudes are still so there about, you know, how to get a woman to sleep with you, basically, how to get her to stay, how to keep her interest. And also, he did it for women as well, but in a very sort of misogynistic way about like oh, yeah. keeping here's, them down. Yeah, here's how to dress yourself up to make sure a man notices you. And here's how to keep yeah, exactly. you on the hook. Thanks, And kind of, you know, don't sleep with him too soon and make him think that other men might be interested, even if they're not. And don't you dare put your makeup on in front of him, all this stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's stuff that you would recognize from sort of modern um, dating tip books. Um, So that was that was key. There's a book called um, for the Satyricon by Petronius, which which is a kind of horrendous in parts because the attitudes towards sex are just pretty horrifying. But it's it's a, a comedy set in most likely Pompeii, but an unnamed town of that period, about 10 years before Vesuvius erupted. And so that was really interesting and instructive for me, sort of learning. So I kind of absorbed all this material. Oh, and obviously we'll talk about him later, but Pliny, the elders' writings was quite key as well. So I'd done a lot of research before I went to the site. And then I went to the museum in Naples, which has got a lot of the treasures and kind of got a real sense from that of the objects. And then finally, I went to the site to sort of piece it all together. Um, And, you know, that really was just invaluable. I mean, you cannot 
even from all the books, which are amazing, just the sense of what it's like to walk around those streets. You know, you can see the counters, the sunken bowls where people <laughs> would have got served their stew. There's the bars, there's these incredible houses. Um, and so even houses that I've invented in the book are based on real places. Um, apart from the Lupana and one or two other kind of places like the baths, I didn't want to get so sort of tied up in, oh my God, if I set it in the house of the centurion, centurion you know, I've got to know exactly where the bathroom was, you know, <laughs> and which corridor went where. Um, so I tended to take houses there and then kind of extrapolate from it. But that's that's kind of what the research looked like. I just loved it. I had so much fun. It was amazing. <laughs> I bet. Well, it's, it's, and I was wondering while I was reading it, you know, you're taking us through the streets and having done some reading about Pompeii myself, I knew that a lot of the buildings that you were mentioning were real places. And I love the way you peppered in all these details that were, you know, very historically accurate, but I was wondering how strictly you felt like you had to stick to like, I was, as I was reading it, I was thinking, is this actually, if you were walking through Pompeii, is this exactly how it would be? Or did she take liberties? And I, I love seeing how authors kind of take the actual historical truth and sometimes fudge it to suit the story they're telling, which is an art. I loved how you talked about the bits of graffiti in Pompeii. There are, you know, no spoilers, but there are two characters who leave each other bits of graffiti. And that's really one of the only ways they had to communicate to each other, which I loved because it's such a big part of Pompeii and, and what we have from Pompeii to sort of know what life was like for people. And when it comes to the ancient world, especially when we're talking about women, there are just so many things that we don't know for certain about what their day-to-day -day looked like, about how they felt. We don't have a lot of documents that really open up their internal worlds for us. So I'm wondering, you know, how did you fill in the gaps in your research? How did you really find your way into the minds and the hearts of these women? So I think um, when I said it took me a long while to write this book, I think what you say is absolutely true. So I did all this research and then you have to take a bit of a leap and have the confidence to fill in the gaps. And also sometimes to do what, you know, can feel like sacrilege is to say, OK, so it probably might not have been exactly like this, but I'm going to make it like this at this specific point. So. Um, I mean, it's like quite a minor detail. So the harbour is very much based on frescoes of um, uh, what harbours along that coastline looked like. Um, and then I had a statue of uh, Venus in the middle of the harbour, which, you know, there's no archaeological evidence that that particular statue is in the middle of the harbour. But I felt like that would, was something that I wanted to put there. So, you know, and it doesn't feel out of place. So whenever I've done that, I mean, sometimes I've been really meticulous. So the sparrow is based on a, a different bar called the Phoenix. And even the sort of sign is um, extrapolated from that. But the more important thing, what you were saying about actually getting into people's hearts and minds. So a book that I read as part of my research uh, called Invisible Romans by Robert Knapp. It didn't actually find his chapter on women quite so helpful, if I'm really honest. But his chapter on slavery and trying to get into the mind world as he puts it of an enslaved person was genuinely eye-opening for me in that he looked at tomb inscriptions at um you know fortune teller things that slaves would have looked at he was really trying to look at the sources that remain which were not elite people talking about enslaved people but how the enslaved people might have seen themselves and you know this kind of longing for freedom and the ways that people might have, have become free and the ways that they might have preserved some aspects of themselves within a very hostile environment in terms of not allowing them a personhood. But everyone has a, a, a personhood. And so I thought, well, you know, um, and then I must admit in this book, he was like, but I don't think, you know, that women would particularly have challenged this very negative view of them. And I thought, well, you know, absolutely, I accept women would not have had like a sense of feminism as a systemic, you know, kind of philosophy. And I really, really, really didn't want to put feminism into the book in a way that would be anachronistic and just that women wouldn't have had that opportunity to think that way. But I do think that women, as much as enslaved people or anyone else, may have felt dissatisfied with what they have. 
I mean, that is just a basic human feeling to be dissatisfied with your lot and to want something else. So I don't think the women would have been satisfied with their lives in this brothel on the whole, particularly not my main characters who didn't start off. Um, one's kidnapped, one, you know, lost all her money. So I kind of based it from the idea of if, if we take as our starting point that just because people were enslaved doesn't mean that they didn't want more. That was really the basis. And then trying to look at what options would have been available to them at that time and then look at, well, if those were your options, what would you do to get there? So that was really the process to sort of look at the environment and basic human traits that we all need friendship. We all need love. We all want to feel valued, to feel secure, um, to be free uh, as much as, you know, and what is freedom, et cetera. But that was the basis. And I thought it was so clever the way you have these women who are in the brothel and they've all come to sex work and enslavement from completely different circumstances. Like you say, one, her family lost all their money and her father passed away and basically they fell on hard times and she lived most of her young life as a free woman and then has ended up in this situation and is trying desperately to survive and make the best of it. One of the characters who I don't want to say too much about because I don't want to spoil anything, but I just found her so compelling was the woman who they called Britannia. Britannica. Yeah. Britannica. Yes. The woman they called Britannica, who I found. Oh, I'm glad you like her because she's a major player in book two. Oh, (laughs) good. Oh, book two. That's probably a bit of a spoiler, but anyway. (laughs) Oh, I'm so glad there's a book two. That's incredible. There's three books. (laughs) Really? Oh, I didn't know that. That's so good because yes, as much as I, I will say nothing about the ending, but as much as I love the ending, it did leave me hoping for more. (laughs) Um, Yeah, no, Britannica I found fascinating because she comes in, you know, to the brothel fairly late in the game. You can tell that she's lived a completely different life, that she was a warrior, that she's, you know, lived as a free woman. And the rest of the women are trying to help her assimilate. And it's just heartbreaking because she's an example of someone who just refuses to even pretend to, you know, she won't even do it to survive. She just is so angry. And I loved her because it felt... I felt like she embodied the rage and the and the sadness I felt for these women who are all doing what they could to survive, but you could see their frustration, you could see their sadness. And I think you're so, you're so right. I mean, there were so many enslaved people in the Roman world and so many enslaved women. And of course, there are people just like us, just because they lived in the ancient world, it doesn't make them any different. I can't imagine that there were a bunch of happy enslaved people who were like, well, this is my life. And my life is fine and I don't want anything else from myself. Of course not. Of course they wanted more. And I, I'm wondering how, I mean, you mentioned feminism, which leads into another question because reading the book, I was really struck by, you're trying to be really true to the ancient world and what it meant to be a woman in this patriarchal system and, you know, to create something that felt real for the time, but you're also catering to a modern audience and to our ideas of a woman's agency and a woman's rights. And how did you grapple with those two things? How did you figure out how to have a little bit of feminism, but like you say, not too much that it felt as if it it wasn't true. It wasn't authentic. So um, I think, you know, ultimately the modern audience is, it, it would win if there was ever a really sort of knotty conundrum about how to go with something but honestly I didn't find it maybe this is troubling I didn't find it as big a gap as I was expecting when I started because I think although so you know again it's not too spoilery to say that Amara the main character the one whose family fell on hard times who was sold into slavery because it was that or total destitution right from the start of the book, her whole burning ambition is to get out of this place, you know, and she's looking for any kind of route out and whether that's working with her pimp on other lines of his business that are not to do with sex or trying to find a patron who will sponsor her and, you know, want to have her higher up the um, scale because, you know, um, brothel worker was not, was, was actually not the bottom of the pile in terms of prostituted women. And it's very difficult because I know, you know, the term sex worker versus prostituted women, but I think there is a real kind of gradation in terms of the amount of agency. So I would generally use the word prostituted woman for the the stage 
of where Amara is at. So, you know, the routes that are open to her, you know, attracting the attention of a wealthier, more powerful man. I mean, that is just a story that we still tell ourselves over and over again from pretty woman to a million romances. You know, it's still the escape route for women from their lives because we still don't have the same opportunities in other areas of life. So I wanted to really think about that in that book in the sense that it's much more naked and brutal in if one person is enslaved and the other is free. So it's not just that somebody is much richer, um, but how does that tarnish every aspect of that relationship? Is it possible to love someone? Is, can you have love between two people and such a massive power imbalance? What does she really feel about him? Does she even know? You know, do we ever even really know why we might be attracted to someone? So there was that aspect. And then, you know, she has a number of, of different people that she has um, feelings for relationships with. You know, and I just tried to explore other other things that were also apparent at the time. So there are some very devoted kind of inscriptions between enslaved people or, you know, a man who was free and his wife was enslaved or a woman who was free who bought her husband. You know, they started off as slaves and then she bought her husband's freedom, you know, and this was kind of a great source of pride between spouses. You know, the idea of one was able to free the other. Um, you know, so there were these really tender, beautiful, loving relationships between people, as I think there always have been. And yes, you know, it would have been within a system of the idea of the man being, you know, yes, it's a, you know, it's a profoundly patriarchal system. But I also think, um, and a number of historians have made this point recently, that what we know about ancient Rome in terms of how they thought about women and men and gender and sexuality is so coloured by the fact it comes from elite sources. And we don't actually know all the time whether, you know, the sort of plebeian people, the common people, how bothered they were about ideas of chastity or, or whatnot in a woman. Maybe they didn't care so much. I mean, they couldn't really care, you know, on the most sort of horrendous um level of two enslaved people who were married in a household you know that neither of them could control what happened to the other you know a man could not stop the master of the household sleeping with his wife and they must have had to have had some way of processing that trauma I think and of still valuing one another and and the relationship so I've kind of diverted a bit from the book but that latter example is a way, I think, of how they're just profoundly different. I mean, I think it's unimaginable for us that a married couple would potentially have to suffer these kind of horrendous incursions into their private, you know, relationship. But equally, the other stuff about how women might use relationships with men in order to gain a sense of self or to gain a material advantage without, in the modern world, maybe thinking about it in quite such stark terms. I think that really does still exist. Yeah, and I do think that's one of the reasons the book resonates so much. And there's so many moments that feel so true and I found deeply affecting because I think you're right. There's so many haunting parallels between then and now more than we want to believe. And so, you know, you see a universal story in this book of women who are fighting to survive, but also fighting for freedom. And sometimes that means having to take drastic measures and, um, you know, the way that they process that. One of the ways they process that that I love in the book is there's such profound friendships that develop between these women. And even though they have very different ways, some of them of dealing with the situation they're in, of processing, you know, the things they're forced to do, that there's such a sense of kinship and sistership and that, you know, they fight for each other. And I loved that. Yes, and they have fun because I think that's such a basic human need as well, honestly, is to have a laugh, you know, and they laugh at the men and they laugh where they can, you know, they, they have a tough time. But I just, you know, however crappy your job or your situation, people want to have friends, they want to have a laugh, they want to find some way to enjoy their lives. So that was also really important to me. I didn't want it to be this kind of grim bleak kind of um, ranting about how awful it was, you know, because that, that's not how we cope with life, I don't think, on the main. And it would have been a very sort of uh, much more sexually segregated environment, you know, the sort of women's baths. I wanted that to be a real, real haven where women were able to hang out together and have the space to sort of chat and do a bit of business um, and enjoy themselves and relax. Um, and I really didn't want to set up the brothel. I mean, there is 
towards the end, you do get a bit of a sense of intention and rivalry between some of the women uh, as their fortunes start to diverge. But I did want to have a have a sense where it wasn't women competing for the attentions of men. They were the key relationships for them were with each other. You know, the clients were business, but the relationships, the loving relationships that they could rely on were with each other. And then the very sort of fraught and um, complex relationship with the pimp, Felix, who I also wanted to make a multi-dimensional character. I mean, he is a monster, but he has reasons for why he's a monster. So I wanted to do that without, like tread a really fine line without kind of making him a character that we make all these excuses for and want to sort of romanticize, but equally an acknowledgement that his life has been incredibly hard as well. Yeah. And I thought you did an incredible job with that because I did hate him. I thought he was a horrible, <laughs> horrible man. But like you say, there's that really fine line between you're a horrible person, but I can see how you became who you are. And because he was enslaved originally, too. Right. Yes. He's a freedman. So we know from the start that he started off as a slave. Um, and then very gradually over the course of the book, we learn more about how and where he was enslaved and what his early life was like, you know, and he's made particular choices. And the relationship with Amara, I wanted to, you know, sometimes I think that's quite uncomfortable to, or it sh I hoped it would be uncomfortable to read when she's really thinking about what Felix means to her and, and how she feels about him. It's a really complex and interesting dynamic. I'm wondering if in the course of your research, I'm sure that you found out a lot about being an enslaved woman in Rome, but specifically being a prostituted woman in Rome. Are there any, is there anything about their lives that you can tell us to help us understand what their day to day would have been like? So no, honestly, and I, I in, not invented, but you know, I just had to use a lot of guesswork. So I had the women go out and about looking for business. In all honesty, it's quite quite possible we don't know it is quite possible that the women in the lupana would have been stuck there that they would just have been stuck in those rooms but that was just a no narrative and b just too horrendous to even want to write about honestly and um, also we don't know that for sure it's also possible that they were kind of freelance you know and would be all like masses of different women who might have rented the space from somebody, in, in, you know, there are so many different potential business models that that could have used, um, that that particular brothel, you know, and um, a scholar called Sarah Levin Richardson has, has actually written a whole book about the brothel and sort of her idea of, of how it might have worked, which I didn't actually use all of that, but it was fascinating and kind of illustrates how little we know and what we can deduce. So things that we do know, we do know from writings that, prostituted women or sex workers, some of them would kind of wander the streets for business as ever. Some were very much street workers um, and the word sort of fornix for archers. And, you know, that comes from women who would be plying their trade by tombs or on the outskirts of the city, right at the bottom of the pile. I mean, grim. And then, you know, you would have brothel workers and then you would have had women who just did a bit of business on the side, um, Potentially, you know, um, women working in taverns and, and bars were most likely doing a bit of business on the side. Uh, again, likely enslaved, so probably not doing business for their own profit. But some women would have been doing this as a way to make extra money. And then further up the scale, you get these kind of kept women or they're almost like it's often translated as the word for that that class of women as girlfriend in say Ovid or whatever. So, you know, they are providing a girlfriend experience, but they are still kept women. But then it becomes much more blurred and complex uh, because, you know, it, it resembles much more a normal, what we would recognize as a relationship, a romantic relationship. So there's this sort of huge spread of what people's lives might've been like, but I think it's really important to say that the distinction we have between um, sex work or prostitution and what it meant to be generally enslaved, male or female, is not such a distinction. So yes, um, 
people who were registered as prostitutes or sex workers, they were a, a separate class of person. They were in, it was called infamia. So they are kind of infamous. It's, it's a stigmatized group of people you have to register. That's, that's a label you can never get rid of. But how much of a stigma this was for people who were all living hand to mouth anyway, I mean, debatable. Sure, if you're like a high class woman, this isn't great. But for anyone else, is that really the main preoccupation? But I think it's and this was one of the really difficult things for me to get my head around about uh, this period is if you were enslaved, you had absolutely no agency. And I used the graffiti really chilling from Pompeii, um, take hold of your slave girl whenever you like, it's your right to use her. And that went for men as well. So both men and women had to live with this, this sense that they could be used at any time. And probably both men and women were used like that when they were enslaved within the household, just as a matter of course. And the thing is, like the Romans did recognize that this was not pleasant for people. So it's really not like people just accepted this as their lot and were kind of fine with it. You know, the Romans knew this was awful and they wouldn't want it to happen to them, you know, the, the free Romans. And then, of course, you've got this whole category of freed men and women who, who are unique to that period of history, people who've endured this life but now don't have it and they don't quite have the same privilege. So that, I have to be honest, I find a really fascinating category of, of of um experience as well so that's definitely going to come up more and more i think as i write write these books <laughs> there's this wonderful scene in the book that i was just thinking about where it, there's a party at the house of a freedman and his wife um who is also a freed woman i believe and it's this sumptuous over the top beautiful place incredible food and amara goes and is just you know gobsmacked by the whole thing but you have a lot of these sort of, you know, upper class patrician guys who are there who are very much looking down on their host only because he's a freedman. And so they think that they're somehow, you know, better than him. It doesn't matter how much money you get the sense that it doesn't matter how much money he makes and is able to accrue that he'll never be able to he'll n never be viewed as their equal. And I thought it was so interesting to see that it's, you know, you're free and you have wealth and you can do so much. And yet. I'm so thrilled you mentioned that party because that was a really specific retelling of Trimalchio's feast in Petronius's Satyricon, in which Trimalchio, the freedman, is the butt of the joke and we're meant to laugh at him and how crass he is. And it is a hysterical scene and he is absolutely over the top. But where Trimalchio is brash and loves himself and just has no shame in the Satyricon, I thought, well, hang on a minute, you know, what are we twist that around. And actually the Trimalchio character, he's not called Trimalchio in my book, and he's a, he's a very different sort of man, is actually riddled with insecurity and he wants to impress these men. And yes, he's making himself look ridiculous, but his aim is because he wants to be accepted and that we should have sympathy with him and not the people who are laughing at him. So that was, I thought a lot about that party scene, so I'm really glad of it stuck, stood, stood out. Were there particular ways where you felt like your research forced your story to evolve so I must admit like I the, the whole plot almost of the whole trilogy came to me quite fast in that I felt it was so the Felix Amara dynamic is quite crucial um and I wanted it to be this almost kind of nemesis relationship and so that that was running through it, but sort of how I told that story then. And the other really crucial point was that I wanted it to be an ensemble piece. So yes, it's about Amara's personal kind of quest for freedom with this nemesis of Felix, but also about a group of women, very different women and how they all felt and how they all react in, in, interacted. Yeah, I mean, the research, it had didn't change anything there was no point where I thought, oh, no, you know, it's all going to collapse now because this is just impossible. So I did try to do enough research kind of first that that wouldn't happen. So I, I no, I mean, I don't think there was anything that came up that really sort of um, skewed things. I would say there were certain things that fed into it so you know the graffiti on the brothel walls with the names of the women you know and sort of traces of, of personality that fed into creating those characters 
but it felt like a more collaborative process between me and the researchers I went along rather than anything else I'd say. So why was there a particular reason why you chose to tell the story through the eyes of both enslaved women and women who were prostitutes? I mean, what was it that made you want to choose that lens and that perspective to to tell the story through? Because I don't think it's often done. And when it is done, it tends to be done in a very particular way. So either a kind of woe is me, this is horrendous sort of lost honour, oh, the shame type, very old fashioned. And and I'm not talking about modern tellings, by the way, I should hasten to add. I'm talking about when we look at it in the past. So it's either kind of, this is all terrible. This is just the worst thing that could possibly happen to a woman. You know, her her honour is ruined. Or it's, you know, oh, kind of giggling women with their boobs out. And I just thought this, I I don't want to look at it like that. I want to look at it differently so I think the fact that there is all this kind of baggage of thinking even thinking about um, prostituted women in the ancient world um, was one of the reasons that I wanted to try and look at it in a fresh way that would make people think about it differently and really to primarily that wasn't my primary interest the fact that they were prostituted honestly because I don't think that the distinction between prostituted women and just women in general is is quite as large as we feel, maybe. I mean, of course it was. And I also don't want to make light of the fact, obviously, the reason Amara is so desperate to escape is because to have absolutely no agency whatsoever is, is, is horrific. So it's a really difficult balance between looking at, yes, this is this is horrifying, Um, I should say, you know, for anyone listening, I never, ever wrote about it in a graphic way, ever. Um, Or even in a, you know, in in an, I hope not in a particularly obvious way either. It's more something that's in the background. You know, we all know what it means to be prostituted. You have to have sex with lots of men. Absolutely no benefit whatsoever to me then writing loads of scenes of Amara or other characters having to have sex with lots of men. I mean, it tells us nothing new. So that's kind of more like the starting point. Okay, we know that aspect of their lives is happening. What else is happening? So I guess it's the what else. That's me burbling around trying to say it was the what else. This cannot be the only thing that we know about or think about this particular group of women. I want to look at all the other things. And that's really what I loved about the book is that you're you're breathing life into what that experience would have been like and and them having to have sex with many clients is in there. But like you say, it's almost background noise and you, you show them as full sort of you show them with desires, you show them with fears and anxieties, you show them with ambitions. It's like these are full these are women living full lives and help each other and sometimes being jealous of each other. But it's like, it's, it's so beyond what they're forced to do um, yeah. to survive. And I love that because you're right. It's totally a story about, well, what else is there? Because of course that's not everything. That's not their whole lives. And that's, that doesn't sum up their experience and who these women were. And you just breathe such life into them. They felt so real to me in reading them. I felt, I felt like I was really there with them, which was sometimes uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but also just the their tenacity and their will to survive, and how you know they each have real low moments, but they help to pick each other up. And they have very different views of their lives and what their experiences mean and what they want. And that was important to me too, because I think with some, something so extreme as that that environment, people find very very different ways to cope. And you know, uh, without wanting to give too too much away, you know, Victoria, one character, she she doesn't embrace the life, obviously, but you know, she does take pride in being a very successful um, sex worker. I mean, she's the only one that I think the term sex worker almost applies. I mean, she still is very much prostituted, and we learn more about because she also puts on a real front. We kind of learn more about her vulnerable side much later. I loved, I loved her. She was so brash and so like, you know, there was a sense of pride in a job well done. And, you know, there were lots of yeah. jokes made about how, how, oh, you always know it's her next door because of how loud she is. And it's just, I loved, yeah. like you said, the jokes and the camaraderie between the women, even in difficult circumstances. But yeah, I thought Victoria was fabulous. 
Yes. And I think, you know, that is one way to cope, isn't it? Okay, well, this is what I have to do. I'm just going to be great at it and, you know, have all the business and, you know, be able to get it over fast if that's what I want. And, you know, to try and because she has no control, really. But what she's giving herself is the illusion of control. That's it. I feel like she almost takes control by becoming she's very good at what she does, but also she really commands a room and she she, as much as she's able to, she really dictates the interaction she has with clients. Yes. And I love that. It's like, well, I'm here. This is what's happening. This is my life. And I'm going to, you know, not necessarily make the most of it, but, you know, do it well and kind of do it as much on my terms as I can. I loved that about her. If you, let's say that someone has finished reading your book, what would you want them to walk away with? Or what do you want them to walk away thinking about after reading your book, if you could choose one thing? Well, firstly, I hope that they experience what you told me which it makes me really happy the sense of time travel of having been immersed in a completely different world you know to come up and be like oh I was in a totally different place for that while I read that book so I guess that's the first thing but then secondly it is very much to think about things particularly this group of women uh, in this time and place in a slightly different way to hopefully not look at the brothel as just this kind of uh, titillating curiosity, but to think about all the other aspects of women's lives and what that might have been like. And, you know, in this podcast, obviously, we're, we're concentrating very much on women. And my book is, you know, primarily about women. But I did also want people to think about the men, too, and what it might have done to them, both the people who were um, kind of perpetrating that system, but also um, suffering under it as well. So a sense of shared humanity, I guess, and how we're not actually that different as we might think. Oh, well, this has been so this has been so enlightening and fascinating. And I've loved talking about your book with you. And I absolutely loved The Wolf Den. It's a fantastic read that I think is going to stick with me for a long time. Thank you so much. Honestly, it's been such a joy to come on. Really interesting to chat. Thank you. Thanks so much to Elodie for joining us. I highly recommend you go and grab yourself a copy of The Wolf Den, which is out now. You can order a copy in the UK and Australia wherever books are sold. For American listeners, Blackwell's in the UK is offering 100% free shipping to readers in the USA. All you need to do is create a free account with them when you order The Wolf Den online. They're also selling the book at a discount, so it's a good deal all around. UK listeners should know that Waterstones is selling a limited, signed edition with exclusive content on the real women and the Lupinar of Pompeii. You'll find a link to that in the show notes as well. Thanks for listening. Until next time.